ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كلام الله عز وجل وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وبعد Indeed, our praise is due to Allah. We praise and we seek His assistance and we seek His forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evilness of our own souls and evilness of our actions. Whoever Allah has guided, there's no one to mislead. And whomever He has led astray, there's no guide for them. I bear witness that there's no deity worthy of worship except Allah. He is one and doesn't have any partners. As I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is His servant and His final messenger. As for what follows, for indeed the most truthful of all speech is the Book of Allah. And the finest guidance is the guidance of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the evils of affairs are novelties in religion. For all novelties in religion will lead to innovation. Every innovation will lead to misguidance. And all misguidance ending places the hellfire. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, last time we was having this class, we, after defining what worship was, we talked about what are the categories of worship that is only acceptable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are many this book the book we're going through in January Ibadatillahi Wahda Comprehensive Worship for Allah Alone the author mentioned 19 different aspects of worship that is not supposed to be disposed of except for Allah we're only supposed to do that for Allah and if we dispose of this worship for anyone else other than Allah, then this removes you from the foes of Islam. As they say in Arabic, it's min al It removes you from the foes of Islam. And the first one the author mentioned was dua, supplication. We talked about it. We, he brought dua, supplication. The author mentioned two ayahs from the Quran. One from Surah Al-Jinn, and, and the number, verse number 18. And the other proof he, proof he brought for the issue of dua, is a verse from Surah Al-Ra'd, the thunder, verse number 14. Now these verses, it's important to understand as we talked about the explanation of them last week. But what we didn't talk about was what was the meaning of dua that we translated supplication. And I wrote on the board here, the meaning of dua, as you see here. I put dua, the meaning of dua, linguistic meaning. <coughs> And we said that dua in Arabic it means sawtul munadi, the voice of a caller. When somebody's speaking to somebody and calling on someone, this is dua, it's a supplication. That's what it means in the Arabic language. The religious meaning of dua is in Arabic is ma yad'u al abdu bihi lillahi khudu'an wa mahabbatan wa istislama, which translates to me. That which the slave, meaning of Allah, supplicates to Allah with while being in a state of humbleness, love for Allah, and submitting and submission to Him. So, religiously, when we make dua, that's the state that we're supposed to be in when we supplicate to Allah, is that we call on Allah with our hearts present to what we're making dua for. This is incumbent when making dua. So, this is the linguistic meaning, and this is the religious meaning of dua. And we mentioned last time in the class that dua were, are two types, a dua unawani. We had two types of dua. The first type of dua that we mentioned is the dua of need. In Arabic, we call it the dua u mas'alatan, dua of need. And we define that as, wa huwa du'a'uhu bi jalbil manfa'ah wa daf'il mudarrah. It is to supplicate to Allah or calling on Him, Allah, the glorified. For him to grant you some benefit or to repel away from you some harm. This is the English definition and Arabic is here. It is calling on him Allah the glorified. For him to grant you a benefit or repel some harm. So you're making dua to Allah for your needs. Is when you need for that's what you do when you ask Allah for your needs. You get him to bring eat you ask him to grant you some type of bounty, some benefit that you're in need of, or you ask him to remove some harm or repel away from you some harm that you may be in. Then the second type of dua or supplication or that we make is called dua of worship. In Arabic it's called dua ibadatan. 
dua of worship, which means wahuwa dua Allah Taala imtithalan li amri. It is calling on Allah by complying to His commandments. As an example of that, it's making salat. When you make salat, how do we pray? We pray the way the Messenger of Allah prayed. Because he says, Sallu kama ra'aytu muni usalli. Pray as you see me praying. Pray as you see me praying. And this is what he commanded. Just like Hajj, when he told them, he says, Khudu anni manasikakum. Take from me your rights of Hajj. In other words, do what he does. Say what he says when performing that worship of Hajj. Likewise with your salah. So when making dua of worship, it is the worship you perform to Allah according to what he commands in his book or what he has commanded with in the sunnah of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We call this dua al-ibadah. And when we was giving these khutbahs, yesterday, today was our seventh khutbah, or I should say yesterday, was uh, our seventh khutbah on al-Fatiha. One of the khutbahs early on I said, I think it was the first one, that al-Fatiha, it has, it has both of these, two types of dua. Dua of need and dua of worship. And when you recite al-Fatiha from alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen until you arrive at iyyaka na'budu, you alone we worship. From the beginning to there, falls under the category of dua of ibadah, of worship. Where you're complying to what Allah commands. You're doing, He teaches you how to supplicate Him, how to worship Him. So you're complying to that when you say all of those portions of Al Fatiha. The second half of Al Fatiha, from Iyaka Nasta'inu, you alone we seek assistance, to the end of Al Fatiha. Is you doing dua al mas'ala, dua of need, where you're calling on him to glorify, to glorify, to grant you some benefit. What's the benefits we're basically asking for? We're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and help us in the worship of him. We're asking Allah to guide us to the righteous people and to imitate the Prophet and the companions. We're asking Allah to subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from going astray or having a wrath upon us from Allah by not practicing what we know and going astray by practicing doing deeds that's innovative practices that has no origin from the religion. And like the Christians, if the Christians worship Allah, we're innovating in his deen. They make it up as they go along. Everybody know Jesus wasn't in no church singing rhythm and blues. He's singing gospel music and all the different nonsense that they created, innovated in their worship. So. We do not, we ask a lot of protection. So this is a dua of need. So in fact, it has a good example of these two, of these two forms of dua. These two forms of dua. So this is what we covered <coughs> last time in the class. And we said the author, Hafizahullah, or Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy upon the author. He mentioned uh, two verses from the Quran to define worship. I mean, to define dua, because these are one of the things that is not permissible to dispose of except for Allah. No one else get this right, and we're going to talk about that. But the two evidence we begin, we mentioned from Surah to Jinn and Surah to Al Ra'd. The first verse again was Wa and al Masajida, and indeed the Masajids, that's the plural of Masjid, and indeed the Masajid are for, for, that, are for Allah, Lillah. So do not call on, do not supplicate to anyone or worship anyone with, along with him whatsoever. With Allah whatsoever. So Allah Ta'ala commands us only to supplicate to him in that verse. In the other verse, Allah gave the example of the dua of the kuffar. When they call on other than Allah. <coughs> Allah Ta'ala says in that verse, لَهُ دَعْوَةُ الْحَقِّ The right of his, of him Allah, is the call of truth, the supplication of truth, of reality. Meaning the one who supplicate with this. The supplication of truth. And those who supplicate and worship anything less than Allah, those things do not respond to their supplication. Be shaitan with nothing whatsoever. Illa, except like the example, like the one who takes his two hands and he spread them out. 
He spread his two hands out in his mouth towards water to be poured into his hand so he can bring it to his mouth. And he had his hand spread completely open. Allah Ta'ala then says, so that he can make the water reach his mouth. And Allah Ta'ala says that water will never reach his mouth. And Allah says the supplication of the disbeliever achieves nothing but going on error of, of for naught. So understanding this, I, Allah gave this example of their dua that they make is like that example of a person who holds his hands wide open to receive some water and he never will be able to hold water with his hands open wide and his fingers spread out. Meaning no benefit. Supplicating to other than Allah brings no benefit. And then the author after that, the Shaykh went on to mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he commands us to call on him. He says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ مُدْعُونِي And your Lord says, call on me. Your, and your Lord says, call on me. أَسْتَجِبَ لَكُمْ I will truly answer you. And this is a very important aspect of the deen that we Muslims must understand. And we're supposed to call on only Allah ta'ala. Rather, one of the means of calling on Allah is saying, Ar-Rahman, his name. Ar-Rahim. And from that, Abdullah ibn Mubarak says, Whoever calls Allah by the name Ar Rahman, either su'ila, if Allah is asked by it, right, you jeep, he responds to the supplication. But this is the supplication to a heart that's present while you're making his dua. A supplication where the heart is present while you're making dua. Please pay attention while we have a class. Y'all can talk afterwards, inshallah. Uh, a heart that is present while you're saying the supplication. A heart that's conscious of what is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. So Allah is saying to that type of dua, call it, say to the Muhammad, call it a bukum. Your Lord says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Ud'uni, call on me, astajibalakum. I'll guarantee I will answer you. And He says in another verse to His Prophet, He says, Wa idha sa'alaka ibadi. In Surah Al Baqarah, Allah says, And when my servants ask you, Muhammad, when my servants ask you, Muhammad, about me, for inni qalib. Let them know that I'm close. Ujibu to da'wa to da'i. Ujibu da'wa to da'i. I respond to the call of the caller, ida da'an. When he calls on me, meaning with some consciousness of the mind and the heart and the tongue, they all coincide in what you're asking for while being humble before Allah and submitting to him. And showing him the need that he has for what you have for him. And this is very important. Because otherwise, Allah, if you don't make dua to Allah, he hates you. Allah hates for you not to supplicate them. Because that's him, you showing him you have no need for your Lord. And you have every need for your Lord. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah ta'ala says in that same verse, which is in Surah Al-Ghafir. Inna ladina yastakbiruna an ibadati. Allah says in Surah Al-Ghafir, the chapter called Ghafir, the Forgiver, verse number 60, in the rest of that verse, after saying, Your Lord, and your Lord says, Call on me and I will answer you. He says, Verily those who are too ar who arrogantly turn away from my worship, Sayyidina Jahannam Dahinin, they will enter the hellfire, the Jahannam humiliated. They will enter the hellfire humili humiliated by Allah Ta'ala. So Allah is informing us that dua, brothers, is not supposed to be disposed of except for Allah. And we want to talk about that in a minute because this condition for when we call on the people and we ask people for help. We're going to talk about that in a second. Now we're going to talk about a hadith from the Messenger of Allah in relation to dua. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, dua who al ibad that dua, supplication, it is worship. In other words, the core of your worship. Supplicating, it is worship. And the prayer is the greatest supplication we make. That's why your heart has to be present. You have to be in a state of humbleness while praying to your Lord and feeling of love for Him. While performing your worship, having a high level of love for Allah and high level of humiliation when performing worship for Allah Taala. 
This is very important because the Messenger of Allah, that's why the Messenger of Allah said, Dua is worship. Dua is worship. As Imam Ahmed narrates this hadith in the Tirmidhi and Ibn Hibban, and the hadith is authentic. Okay? There's another hadith that's, more, that's famous, but its meaning is authentic, but the narration itself is unauthentic. The Prophet never said it, but the meaning is accurate. And it says, which means supplication is the core of worship. That's not authentic, but the authentic one is more accurate. That dua is worship. I mean, you can't separate dua from worship. And that's very important to understand because unfortunately you go to some Muslim countries. Like I experienced in, the in Egypt. I walked in a masjid in by Azhar University called Masjid al Hussein. And I saw on the wall a bunch of people standing up, leaning up against the wall like this. And it was a little hole in the wall that had three or four of them going down this wall like this, for example. A little hole. And someone would have something that they wrote, they would throw it through the hole. They would throw it through the hole. And I don't know, I was, this is my first time ever seeing this. I was probably my first year in Egypt. This was in 1995. I entered the masjid, I swim to make salah. I see all these people over there in the wall making a supplication. What are they doing? <laughs> now the Kibla, I think the Kibla was facing that way. They was at the wall, facing the wall, supplicating. But the Kibla was facing that way. And I'm making so I'm going to go pray. So, at first I didn't notice it. I just sort of standing there. Then after maybe Wudu came back and I went to go pray, I noticed these people standing at this wall. So I just go and hurry up and try, make my prayer and I walk over to see what's going on. And what is that they thought? And when I come to find out, I pulled somebody to the side and said, what are these people doing? I asked the, one of the brothers at the Meshit, why are they doing this? He tells me, oh, they're calling on, H on Hussein. I think he said, oh no, it was somebody that was buried there in the masjid. They had a grave attached to the masjid. He was buried behind this wall. And they were throwing their personal du'as through the hole so that the dead person can supplicate to Allah for their needs. And this is shirk. This is the core of shirk. <coughs> And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in his Quran, he says that if the Qurrabuna ilayhi zulfa, that they believe that these dead individuals can draw them closer to Allah. Because they believe that they're sinners, they're wrongdoers. Allah ain't gonna answer my dua. So let me call on this dead person to get them to answer my dua go make dua to Allah because they were righteous he died the right they don't even know this man they just heard he was a righteous man and they make dua to him and Allah Ta'ala mentioned to us in the Quran that you cannot make the dead hear you cannot make the dead hear but yet they supplicate to this dead man because these individual Muslims are ignorant of who Allah is, are ignorant of their own belief. So they in this masjid, instead of worshiping Allah, they worshiping a man that can't hear and can't bring them no benefit whatsoever. Committing, there's no difference between what they're doing and what the Christians do when they call on Jesus. This is major shirk. I've seen sometimes at some places after that, people prostrating at the grave of a dead man, born and raised Muslim, prostrating. Like you're only supposed to prostrate to Allah. This is the type of nonsense the Ummah of Muhammad. Then, unfortunately, when I went to the Prophet's Masjid, I saw the same thing. People will come near Hajj. And you got, alhamdulillah, at that time when I went, you had guards with whips. They striking these people to make them turn back. Because it's that shirk. It's not permissible. Allah Ta'ala says, Inna hu man yushrik billah. That whoever associate partners with Allah commit shirk, Allah says, truly we have made paradise haram for this person. 
So they're trying to stop these people from doing this. Muslim. But because they don't know their belief, they fall into this evil. Be- and that's why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ad du'a'u huwa al-ibadah. That supplication, it is worship. That's it. So that makes it clear. There is no supplication to no one but Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So it's important for us to understand that reality. So from there, what we wanted to say is Allah Ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran, Shaykh Hussain says as an explanation, Allah says to us in the Quran in the same chapter, Ghafir, the, for, the forgiver, verse number 14, Allah says, فَدْعُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ Now children, I want y'all to hear this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Call on your Lord sincerely making a religion for him. Let's ask a few questions. What is religion called in Arabic? Does anybody know? Religion? Deen. Deen. We always translate the word a deen to mean religion, but it's far more deeper than that, brothers. Nah. Forgive me, I thought deen was what meant way of life. That's more closer to the true meaning. But religion is a part of its meaning, but it's not a full translation. The word deen is used for a couple things in Arabic. Number one, deen means the day of judgment. Why? Literally, the word deen means jaza, recompense, being rewarded. That's why Allah Ta'ala calls the day of judgment yawm deen as we say in Al-Fatiha. Yom the day of deen The day of recompense What's recompense mean? The day of receiving your reward or punishment for your actions Deen is used in Arabic also to refer to the meaning of debt We just take, a, take the kessel off of the word deen and put a fatta above it Deen becomes debt Because it is anything connected to where payment is involved You understand? So when we say, like when Allah Ta'ala says to the Qur'an, الْيَوْمُ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ Today I have completed for you your deen, meaning your means of earning rewards and punishment. I completed for you today. This is how you're going to earn your rewards. This is how you're going to earn your punishment. So this is what the deen is. And if we understood that meaning, it makes you become more serious about your religion. Because that's all Islam is about. The highest level, the last level of seeking knowledge as a student of knowledge when you study with Islam with the scholars in the universities and with the scholars, the last level you learn is the rewards you get for the various things you do and punishments. That's very important. This is why our religion is a deen. It's a way of life. Is how you live your life earning rewards or punishment based on the choices you make in life. So, when we hear that dua, who al ibadah, that supplication, it is worship, that we must understand when Allah Ta'ala says, Fadru, and I command, Allah says, Fadru Allah, call on Allah, Mukhlisina, in a state of sincerity, meaning while you're calling on Him, your heart is present, you only intending Him. You believe he the only one can re- repel harm or bring benefit. You don't we believe he the only one that can re- provide the rewards or the punishment. So you call on no one but him. That's what means being sincere, being making being sincere to him. Lahuddin and making your religion sincere to him. Making your earning seeking your rewards and punishment only from him. This is very, very important that y'all understand it. So the question the Sheikh then says, For kayfa yusraf dua So how in the world can supplication be disposed of for anyone else other than Allah? Min al anwat from the people who have died already. What as jar from trees? People who people who worship trees. Well ahjar and rocks. Well jinn, what shayatin worship the jinn and worship the devils. Well ghaibin and those who worship those who are absent, not present, like the dead. Or somebody that's alive, but they're not present. They're not in front of them. There's people that do that. 
all of this Islam says is only for Allah so for that reason the Sheikh then says كل ذلك لا يجوز all of that is not permissible كل ذلك شرك all doing or any of that is polytheism with Allah and polytheism in Islam means دعوه غير الله مع الله it is to supplicate and call and worship other than Allah along with Allah like how the Jew Christians worship Jesus with Allah Rather, as we said before, you never see a people that commit shirk except, meaning worship others along with Allah, except that you will find those people worship the thing that they worship with Allah more than they worship Allah, giving more reverence to the thing they worship with Allah more than they give reverence to Allah. In the churches, anybody who was ever a Christian, you hear Jesus' name more than you hear God. That's the nature of shirk. They, they give the reverence to Allah I mean to the thing that they associating partners with Allah with They give more reverence to that thing than they do to Allah Allah is on the back burner He's secondary And that's the nature of shirk So this is why it's important to understand these two types of dua The dua of need is the dua supplicating for what you need What you're requesting the requesting of your needs from Allah, the Lord of all that which exists, is worship. And that we must be not like the Christians. We must not be like the Christians. Who they got to go to a man and sit in the church, go to this confession room and confess all their sins to them. Allah doesn't need that. Allah Ta'ala tells us again in the ayah we mentioned from Baqarah, after he gave all the ahkam of, of fasting, he said to his prophet, and when my servants ask you Muhammad about me Tell them that indeed I am close I respond to the call of the caller When he calls So let them respond to me Meaning worship him alone And let them believe in me so that perhaps they will be Yerushudun, they will be guided. So Allah Ta'ala want us to know He's near. He don't need no man, nobody between us. He here better than the one who's sitting next to that you're telling your sins to. He might even hear all your speech, like the example with Surah to Mujadila, the woman who came arguing about her husband to the Prophet, Khawla, bin to Khuwaylid. She came to the Messenger of Allah because her husband said to her, Girl, you like my back. I ain't gonna mean it. I'm not gonna touch you no more. You like my mother to me. You like my mother's back. I don't want you no more. The Arabs used to do this before the advent of Islam. So when the issue came up during the Prophet's prophecy, they went to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Khawailid, I mean, uh, uh, Khawla went to the Prophet to find out what's the case, what's the situation with my husband. We got all these kids and... And the prophet couldn't hear everything she said. Aisha narrated this story. She said, we couldn't hear everything she was saying. And before we could finish understanding what she was saying, Allah revealed to the prophet. Surah to Mujadila. Where Allah wa ta'ala, he says in that surah, Indeed Allah has heard the one who came to you complaining of arguing with her about her husband. And verily Allah heard y'all speech and discussion. Indeed Allah is the all hearing, the all seeing. And they couldn't even hear the full speech, the prophet with his wife. And Allah told them what the speech was and revealed it to the prophet. So you telling me I need to go and confess my sins to someone else other than Allah. When the one who's all hearing, all seeing, he can hear my supplication way before, far better than what I can tell you while you're sitting right there in front of my face. So understand that reality when Allah Ta'ala, he wants us to supplicate to him and call on him alone. That dua of need is the dua again asking Allah for all the needs that we have. For either can I mean al Rabbihi since the servant is calling to his Lord, the end of who yet the domino if the because he's calling on his Lord for his needs because 
he is included in a person in being dire need of Allah, the Lord of all that which exists. He must seek protection towards him. So he must have the belief that the one he's supplicating to is Qadir. He is the one who's fully capable to do what he wants. No one else. He's Kareem, he's the most generous. And that he has expansive bounty, rahmah and mercy. He says, so this is the mindset we must have when we call on Allah. We can't have short-minded thinking that Allah ain't going to answer my dua. We can't have short-minded thinking believing Allah ain't listening to you because how sinful you are. We can't think like that. That's the ways of the Christians. Who, if they die on that disbelief, they're going to the hellfire forever. For committing the worst sin ever. To worship others along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, when there initiates from the slave of Allah, calling on someone from the creation, and the one who he's calling on, he can comprehend what you're saying, and he has the capability to respond to you. He's alive. This is the condition when call, that it's permissible to call on another human being. <clears throat> Number one, he must be high. He must be alive, not dead. Breathing, conscious, sane. He must be alive. Hadir. He must be in front of you. Present, or on the phone, I should say. <laughs> he must be present. Number two. Number three, he must be called him. He must be capable of giving you what you're asking for. You can't ask him for something that is outside of his capability. Because you know he's limited. Only Allah is called of everything. But this individual, you know he's limited. Anyone else in Allah is limited. So if you go to another human being or creation and ask them for something, number one, they must be present. Number two, they must, number one, they must be alive. Number two, they must be present. Number three, they must have the capability to give you what you're asking them. Number four, Oh no. So in that, well istiana to bihi fi shay'in maqdur alayhi. So if you're seeking his help or her help in that which they have capability to do, and they, those conditions are met, then there's no problem in that. And that is not, not enter into committing shirk. And giving someone the right that only belong to Allah. Let's give an example. As the Sheikh in the book he gives an example. He says, that if you was to say to your brother who's present in front of you, Ya Abdullah, oh Abdullah, <clears throat> please help me cut this tree down. But I bet to be that there's no problem in that. Because he's what? He's alive, he's present, and he's capable to help you with that. You see? That's an example. And this issue is similar to Dua'av Mesala. Dua of need It's permissible to have supplication of need To someone who's in their capability You know brother full of cash And you, you on hard times like, Can I borrow a hundred dollars He's present He's helping you But if the brother's in California He has nowhere near no his phone And I go Oh Ali <coughs> Please give me a hundred dollars So I can pay my bill I don't believe that now you're doing to that person that which is only in the capability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this type of supplicating is haram. Brother is major shirk. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Oh sorry. And as far as dua of worship. An example of that to understand that further as we defined it here as calling on Allah by complying to his commandments. To give more clarification. It is that the one who's calling on Allah with his supplication Is that he, he's giving servitude to that thing in worship Seeking a reward from that thing that he's calling on While fearing from his punishment That's how he sees the one that he's making his word, giving his worship to That he believed that thing has the ability To give him a reward when he seeks it from him and he fears from his punishment if he disobeys him. You must feel like that about the person you worship. You want that you worship, which is only Allah. And if you feel like that about anyone else from the creation, even if I go and ask that person for some help in his capability, but I feel as though 
he has that capability to reward me or he has his capability to punish me. This is haram still. You fall into the shirk. Because even the very concept, like I can walk up to you and you brothers, smack you, stab you, <coughs> rob you and take your money, perhaps try to beat you up, and that's harming you, right? I could benefit you too if I come up to you and give you some money or buy you a car. That's a benefit, right? But what's the difference? If you really believe that person can grant those things to you, this is shirk. You have to believe he's only able to do that because Allah had written it for you already. And if he doesn't give it to you or help you, Allah didn't write it for you. Did you not hear the hadith or the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that said, La ujtama'u, that if the nations was to gather, La ujtama'atul al-ummatun, that if the nation was to gather, li an yanfa'uka bi shay'in, to bring benefit to you for a thing. Lan yanfa'uka bi shay'in, Prophet said, they will never be able to benefit you with anything, illa ma katabahu Allahu lak. Except for that which Allah has already written for you. That you don't know what it is. Allah has already. So you will know what's written for you when you receive it. And the Prophet went on to say, and if they were to, nation, all of mankind was to gather to cause harm to you with a thing. Lam yaduruka, they will never be able to harm you illa bi shay'in kad katabahu Allahu alayk. Except that Allah has, they will never be able to harm you with anything except that which Allah has has written or against you. Jufatul aqlam, the pins have dried up. The pins have dried up. I mean, rufi'atul aqlam, the pins have been lifted, or jufatul suhuf, and the books have dried out. No more writing for what's going to be. And this is how we have to believe. This is why the Messenger of Allah says, even for what you're going to ask another human being that's alive, that's present, and is in his capability to help you or repel harm from you, Allah Ta'ala says, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that if you ask, ask Allah. Then you go ask someone else. Because if Allah didn't write it for you, it ain't gonna happen. I remember brothers, I'm going to use myself as an example. I needed, I couldn't pay my rent one month. And I'm in the middle of the next month, but I ain't pay my rent yet for this month. I'm near the end of the month. And I tried all these means to get money. Every door was closed on me. I tried this and I tried that and I tried this and I tried that. Allahu Musta'an. Nothing was happening for me. But I didn't stress. Because I knew what was meant for me, it was going to happen. From the creation. What wasn't meant for me, it wasn't going to, it wasn't meant, it wasn't going to come to fruition. No need to stress over something that wasn't written for me. And when I'm going to know it's written for me, when it happens. I still kept putting the effort out. I still kept striving. Doing this and doing that and doing this. And eventually I got it. Kept asking Allah. Before I asked anyone. So when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ That if you ask, ask Allah. وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ And you seek assistance, فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ Seek assistance from Allah. I don't care who you're going to ask. You ask Allah first. And why is this paramount for the Muslim? Because if, it don't, if you don't get what you need from the people, you won't be grieving and stressing. Because you know when you went to ask him, it's only going to happen if Allah, who you ask first, going to give it to you. And know, brothers and sisters in Islam, that Allah always answer our dua. He always answer our dua, but it's going to be one of three ways. He either going to give it to you in this life. May not be right away, right this morning, but he's going to give it to you. Might be tomorrow, next week, but he's going to give it to you. Number two, he's one of the three things of how he, way he answered your dua the prophet told us. He's either going to give it to you in this life, or two, 
He's going to not give it to you in this life and give you something way better than it in the hereafter. Or three, because he's not going to give it to you now, he will repel a harm that was written for you in the near future. In the future. He's going to repel it from happening to you. So if we really understood and trust and believed in Allah, brothers, we would be making dua all the time. All the time because who don't want harm repelled from them that you can't foresee coming? Do you know how many times your dua could have saved you, saved you from some harm that you didn't even know was going to happen? You know when you're going to know? When you're standing in front of Allah, your muqiyamah. When you supplicated for this, I protected you from that. Heal it. This is what I give you in the hereafter for what I didn't give to you in the dunya. Or he gave it to you in the dunya. Allah answers our dua. That's why it behooves me when a Muslim, he sits there and he don't think Allah subhanahu ta'ala is going to answer his dua. He get negative thinking about his Lord. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah ta'ala said, Ana fi dhunni abadi bi. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I, and then Allah ta'ala said in the Hadith Qudsi, that I am how my servant thinks I am. If you think he's not going to answer dua, he won't. Because you ain't loving and trusting on him when he done gave you all these ayats and hadiths about his greatness and him, the possession of the dunyas in his hands. Al khayru kulluhu biyadayk. Goodness and all of his manifestations in the hands of Allah. Nasiyati fi yadi. My forelock is in the hands of Allah. Adilun fiya qada'u. It's just your decision for me in this life. This is how the believer is supposed to think. Allah looking at that belief you got in your heart, for he sees it. Just like you, we see each other, Allah sees what's going on in your heart. He sees with the blood that's flowing through your veins. He knows the intentions that's through you, the thoughts that's in your mind. Ya'lamu. He knows the hidden secrets behind, uh, uh, the, hidden secrets behind the eyes. لا تخفى منه خافية. Nothing is hidden from Allah. Allah says in the Quran. Nothing is hidden from Allah. That's why it behooves me when a Muslim be treacherous and deceptive, and he don't really understand his Lord. It's easy to deceive, and Allah Taala says, "Just takfuna min nas They hide from the people. Their real intentions, their real objective, their, their treachery and their sneakiness. يَسْتَخْفُونَ مِنَ النَّاسِ Allah says they hide from the people وَلَا يَسْتَخْفُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ But they cannot hide from Allah مَا يَكُونُ نَجْوَى ثَلَاثَةٍ There's not a, a secret conversation of three إِلَّا هُوَ رَابِعُهُمْ Except that he's the fourth Allah says in the Quran وَلَا خَمْسَةٍ It's not a secret conversation of five إِلَّا هُوَ سَادِسُهُمْ Except he's the sixth one in that conversation وَلَا أَدْنَا مِنْ ذَلِكَ وَلَا أَكْثَرُ Nor any numbers less than that of secret conversations or greater than that. إِلَّا هُوَ مَعْهُمْ Except that he is one of أَيْنَ مَا كَانُوا Wherever so they, they, they may be. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ Indeed Allah is over everything the all-knowing. So how in the world can you deceive these treacherous and deceptive when Allah is going to hold you accountable for it? So here when we look at this issue, dua of ibadah, it is that this one who's supplicating with his supplication to the one he's supplicating to, he's giving servitude to him. But that servitude is that he's seeking a reward from him and fearing from his chastisement. And this is not to be disposed of and not correct except for Allah Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of all that which exists. And to dispose of your supplication for other than Allah is the major shirk مخرجون عن الملة that removes you from this religion from this way of life call the Sheikh Islam so that's the definition of dua ibadah supplication of worship Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah he says rahimahullah وكل دعاء عبادة مستلزم لدعاء مسألتي وَكُلُّ دُعَاءِ مَسْأَلَةٍ مُتَضَمِّنٌ لِدُعَاءِ الْعِبَادَةِ Ibn Taymiyyah says that every supplication of worship necessitate sup- the be in it, the supplication of need. 
And every supplication of need is included in the supplication of worship. In reality, they the same. They've only been separated to distinguish the different forms of it. But both of them is only for Allah. For Wallahi, brothers, if you realize this statement of Ibn Taymiyyah, it takes me back to what we said before. I'm not going to ask Asha for anything except I'm going to ask Allah first. That is, he's alive and he's present and he's capable of. I'm going to ask Allah first. If he's straight, I said, man, I ain't giving you a dime. You a broke joker. He say something like that to me. I'm mad. Won't you just call me Akhi? Man, you need to stop begging Akhi. I just smile at his face. MashaAllah, they amen for me. He can say what he want. Because he ain't going to be there when I'm barefooted, naked, and uncircumcised. And have to answer for what I said, did, and felt, and thought. He ain't going to be there. Because your Mokiyama brothers, that's right. What you intended, it will be exposed on the day of judgment. That's no more secrets that day. Allah says, Yom The day that all the secrets will be tested and exposed. All your secrets. Ain't no hiding on that day. That's why we're going to be barefoot, naked, and uncircumcised. Your intention is going to be present, witnessed. Test it. So, so the statement of Sheikh Hussain ibn Taymiyyah that every supplication of worship necessitate supplication of need, and every supplication of need is included in supplication of worship. They connect it. They connect it. Don't call on no human being. Turn to your Lord. If He don't want something for you, don't be mad. Cause being mad ain't gonna change the reality that it ain't gonna happen. Like Ali ibn Abi Talib has said, which one of the two decrees of Allah should I be angry for? For the meaning of what he said. Which one of Allah's two decrees should I be angry about? The one that was never going to reach me or the one that was never going to pass me by? Should I rejoice over what's going to come to me when it was going to come to me anyway? But a person who really thinks it's their efforts that brings about what they have, it's a means to it, but it's not the thing that caused. How many times somebody strove hard and hard and hard to achieve something? Never got it. A striving that you look at and say, man, I did half of that. And he never got it. Because it ain't, it ain't him that gonna get it. It is Allah writing it for you. We have to realize this. Does that mean we don't strive? No, we still strive because we don't know what's written for us. But it is Allah that provides these things for us. And the moment we realize this, wallahi, this, don't, this is when you become that believer that don't grieve too much. Nor do you rejoice too much. Why would I rejoice? So you see a person that put their effort and they finally achieved, it's been 10 years, they've been striving for this and they get it. He might do two black flips, 100 semis. He like, we're over rejoice. Go get drunk, party all night. Because he really think it was him. That's not the believer. No, we go show gratitude to Allah. We go thank him, prostration of gratitude. We increase in giving him more obedience because of what he gave us. Because when Allah give you something, can't nobody take it from you. And when Allah don't want you to have something, can't nobody give it to you. That's the believer. That's the believer. And so the author, Rahimahullah, after mentioning that, he goes on into the other 18 categories of worship that's not supposed to be disposed of for Allah. And when he mentioned these categories, most of them is things we could do with the creation, but they got to meet those three conditions. They have to be alive, they have to be present, and it has to be in their capability. Okay? And the next two categories he mentions, he says, Dhakar al Sheikh al Musanna, that the author, the Sheikh, he mentions, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, may Allah have mercy upon him. The other two categories from the categories of worship. Faqal, he said, Wal isti'anatu wal istighathatu, which is al isti'ana, seeking Allah's assistance. I write that on the board. Al isti'ana. Al isti'ana seeking help or assistance seeking 
assistance. And we're going to say this for next week to talk about it. And the second one is Al Istighatha in Arabic. I'm trying to teach y'all Arabic. Al Istighatha. Istighatha. Seeking. Rescue. What's the difference between the two? That's the only thing we're going to talk about. And then we're going to close because it's almost time for you, Shah. Seeking rescue. Okay? See, I like to put stuff on the board because I'm trying to teach you your religion. I'm not trying to entertain nobody. We're trying to educate and bring everybody closer to a Lord, to our Lord, and that's only through acquisition of knowledge. So, these are the next two categories of worship that's not supposed to be disposed of, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the first one is Al Isti'ana. Can y'all say that? Al Isti'ana. Seeking assistance. Number two, al istighatha, which is seeking rescue. What's the two? What's the difference? They similar but different. Seeking assistance is just seeking help for just basic stuff, like I need help with my, with my bills, I need help with lifting this or that, or I need a lot to help me with my worship, like this. Istighatha is seeking rescue, meaning when you in dire need, like I'm in a fire and I need to be rescued. That's just the author. When I'm having a heart attack and I need an ambulance to come save me, that's just the author. That's the difference between the two. Okay? And the author, he mentions an ayah for istiana, and he mentions an ayah for istiqafah. I'm going to give you those two ayahs and we're going to close with that. The ayah that he gives for istiana, seeking assistance, is al Fatiha, verse 5. So that the, or I should say one, five, which is the verse Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'ina. You alone, yasta'inu. You alone, we worship, and you alone, we seek assistance. That's the part. Seek assistance. That's istighatha. But it's only one type of a seeking assistance that's only for Allah. We can seek assistance from human beings too, but they got to meet those three conditions. And istighatha. The evidence he gives for that is uh, a verse that's in Surah Al-Anfal. Surah Al-Anfal, I'll try it in English. Anfal, which means the war booty. Anfal, verse uh, number nine. Allah Ta'ala says in that surah, or that verse, if testadithuna that if you seek rescue Rabbakum <coughs> from your Lord Right? Fastajaba <coughs> lakum He will truly answer you You just got You, you are rescued That's the time your heart be present When you You about to die You in dire need Then you will call on Allah Without No in-betweens Without Anything else So That's the proof of Istighatha And that's This is the proof of this one and Fatih has the proof of that one. And wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammadan wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. And after he called them, we answer questions, inshallah.